As you can see here, we have already met two panelists, uh, Clemens and Alessio, and I'm going to introduce to you the others. So Dr. Danette Daniels received her bachelor from Columbia University and PhD in biophysics from Yale University. Uh, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University School of Medicine, studying the biophysical and biochemical mechanism of the WNT signaling pathway. She has been at Promega Corporation for 15 years and is currently the R&D group leader of functional proteomics. She leads the team developing technology and performing research to understand dynamic intracellular interaction with the focus area of epigenetics, targeting protein degradation, and drug discovery. Welcome, Danette. Thank you. Uh, uh, then we have uh, Rutger Vollmer, and uh, is the director of medicinal chemistry at Simeres, our sponsor in Imega in the Netherlands. Uh, Rutger is responsible for a handful of team, each running one or more medicinal chemistry project in the aid to lead and lead the optimization stages. Before joining Merca Chem, Rutger worked for about 20 years at AstraZeneca in Sweden, where he was responsible for various constellations of structural biology groups with focus of biophysical technique and fragment-based lead generation. During later years, he also had a portfolio management role in the respiratory inflammation and autoimmunity disease area. Welcome, Rutger. Thank you. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Malin Lemurelle. She's the head of medicinal chemistry in cardiovascular, renal, and metabolism at AstraZeneca Gothenburg, Sweden. Since 2013, she has been leading the department with more than 60 medicinal chemists supporting the portfolio across multiple chemical modalities. Mali received her PhD at the Gothenburg University in 1999 in organic chemistry after postdoctoral study with Prof, uh, Professor Barry Sharpless at the Scripps Research Institute in California. She joined AstraZeneca as a scientist and has subsequently had various leadership roles. Malin is the author of multiple publications and patents, including the patent of AZD5718. Her current interests include the uh, drug design across small molecules and new modalities, including products targeted drug delivery, dragging RNA using small molecules, and developing drug hunters of the future. Welcome, Malin. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, we have uh, Dr. George Winter. He obtained his degree uh, from the Medical University of Vienna, working on elucidating the mechanism of action of antinoplastic drugs. He continues training in chemical biology, working as postdoc with Jace Bradnett at Harvard. There, he innovated the first pharmacological solution to in vivo target protein degradation. He was recruited as CMMPI in 2016. There, his research is now focused on using the unique molecular pharmacology of targeted protein degradation to understand this rough fundamental principle in gene controlling cancer. George co authored 35 manuscripts, including publications in Science, Nature, Nature Chemical Biology, Nature Genetic, and Molecular Cell. His interdisciplinary research lab is supported by several national and international grants and fellowships, including an ERC starting grant. George's contribution to the field of targeted protein degradation was acknowledged via multiple prizes and awards, including the prestigious Eppendorf Awards 2019 and the Elizabeth Luce Award of the Austrian Academy of Science. Welcome, George. Thank you. Great to be here. So thank you all for joining this roundtable. So maybe we will uh, um, go a bit over time to take questions. So for all the audience, they can, uh, they can stay longer and um, ask more questions to the speaker. So how we are going to do it, I will start by asking some questions that we have already prepared for the speaker. And I encourage the audience to write questions in the chat and propose topics for this discussion. So the first question is related to undragable targets that we have already heard a bit about it. If you can share your opinion and experience on how we can crack this target with the currently available chemical tool that we have heard about today. And so maybe George, you would like to start uh, sharing your opinion. Sure, I mean, I, I think that Protex and heterobiological functional degraders would be or are a very important first step in that direction. I think the particularly the two uh, targets that Alessia has shown in SMARCA 2.4 and, and uh, BD 7.9 are particularly interesting because they allow, I think there were some of the first examples that allow us to degrade ligandable proteins, but where ligand, liganding that particular domain does not have a phenotypic consequence. 
So I think that's a very nice example of a, de a degrader of turning a maybe not functional ligand or inhibitor into a functional degrader. I think to further expand the field, I think uh, having new chemical matter for novelty three ligases will be important. Um, and what my, my personal interest is, is very strongly geared to is, is going away from these heteropy functional degraders to monovalent degraders or molecular glues, because I think they will ultimately also allow us to degrade unligandable targets, which might be a bit trickier with Protex, even though I think Alessio might disagree. And I think there's also uh, strong arguments to be made that the distinction between glues and Protex is maybe not as binary as sometimes we draw it in our reviews. So um, someone else would like to jump in and share his opinion. Maybe Malin would like to comment uh, on um, um, the, possible, the possibility to use small molecules also for uh, undragable targets. Yes, uh, absolutely, thank you. So uh, I was reflecting first of all to, on your uh, comment there around the opportunity with the Protex with not just uh, finding non-functional ligands that can turn into functional Protex, but also what Alessia has pointed out earlier around the opportunity to actually find different pharmacology with the Protex around uh, getting degradation and uh, reaching out for the scaffolding effects, et cetera, and maybe degrade other counter partners to the protein, which I think is really a great opportunity, which you see. But then back to new opportunities to for small molecules. I'm, as pointed out earlier, I'm really interested in the area of utilizing small molecules into dragging RNA, which is another way of opening up uh, the target landscape because Historically, we talked about undruggable landscape getting smaller and smaller. I think the degraders opens up one door, but then approaching the RNA level with small molecules, and we see all the advancements in that area, it's another great way for us as kind of small molecule medicine and chemist train experts to actually have great opportunities in the future. Thank you, Marlin. So um, someone else would like to comment, uh, maybe Danette or Rutger? Yeah, I can comment. I think uh, uh, both uh, what Jorg and Melin have had to say are, are, are very excellent ways, especially to utilize small molecules that maybe didn't achieve the phenotypic outcome as inhibitors and then leverage these as degraders. I think there's fantastic technology going on, development for DNA encoded libraries to discover novel binders, novel ligands in this small molecule space that could then potentially be used uh, to develop degraders of, of truly undruggable targets. So targets for which we don't have a, a known inhibitor from which to start uh, protag development. Uh, there's also other great approaches uh, to understand what is the phenotype? Is, is a target something that we should try to degrade? and uh, work done at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, as well as uh, Craig Cruz's lab in GSK, and Alessio's lab with uh, Dario Alessi, uh, show that tag protax um, will allow you to study uh, what the degradation phenotype looks like uh, utilizing this system before you maybe go after or pursue what might be a novel binding ligand uh, for an undruggable. Uh, thank you very much, Danette. So maybe we can uh, uh, move to the to the next question. So a lot of uh, people in the chat are asking about the possible application of uh, Protax. So um, in now, the Protax are used to apply in the field of oncology. If you foresee the, possi the possible application in other uh, uh, disease areas, including the infection diseases, and uh, which are the major obstacles uh, to widen their application to other disease areas. So would, who would like to start to comment on this question? Maybe I can take, take this one. Perfect. Um, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any fundamental reason why it should be limited to only oncology. I think one of the reasons that, that we've seen uh, most, uh, most protects being developed thanks to oncology is that it's simply an area where it's, it's relatively easy to make progression and also 
um, in terms of maybe some of the toxicities that, that people will encounter is you know there's there's more room for that in, in an oncology program um, I, I think one reflection that maybe goes back a little bit to the previous question as well is that that also what we've seen so far uh, in, in terms of products in the literature has been predominantly on molecules that on, on um, uh, target of interest uh, compounds that already existed. So people usually took known binders and converted them into protex. And also these known binders are, are uh, I mean, they are for any disease area, but, but, but also there's of course many, many, uh, many compounds in, in, uh, in oncology. And I think that's also one of the major challenges that, that I would still see in, in making additional progr progress against against difficult targets, is that what we what I would like to see is a couple of examples in the literature where Protex have been successful against targets where where it was impossible to find a, 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 a ligand or a functional ligand uh, that would just work as, as an inhibitor. So I think that's a challenge still that the field has to uh, uh, to progress there and and uh, and be better. But to the original question, there's no reason why 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 Protex would be limited to, to, to any other indication. I would make an exception maybe for the CNS. It was also uh, part of the last talk. Um, uh, you know, a big, a big uh, difference between Protex molecules and regular small molecules is, is of course, their, their large size and, and polar surface area. Uh, and, and that will, even though they may have some, some chameleontic uh, properties, that, that will pose uh, additional problems of getting them across the blood brain barrier. So that's definitely an area where, where where progress will be slower, I think, than in the other ones. Thank you. Um, so maybe Alessio, you want to share your opinion on or experience about the possible use of the products in different areas besides oncology. Sure. Uh, you know, we've been primarily done. Um, of concept studies or you know on cell lines but obviously we're, we're very active on uh development of these molecules of therapeutics i, I mean uh, i think Rut rutger has, has covered some some valuable points there it made sense to start in oncology for all sorts of reasons um but you know targeted de protein degradation as a modality meaning the opportunity to degrade proteins um it's potentially disease agnostic um um, and it's potentially, uh, you know, organism agnostic if we can if we can do that by hijacking uh, whatever pathway that particular cell and organism has, uh, then then in theory we we have an entry uh, to to multiple diseases. Uh, I, I would just perhaps just you know challenge um, Radger's point there about uh, you know CNS. I, I mean I think that. It is true that, um, that, that there's a restriction, uh, uh, there's a sort of higher bar in terms of uh, entering CNS, but there's in theory no particular reason why a well-designed and high, you know high-quality chemical matter uh, that is bifunctional in nature would not pass a CNS uh, across the blood-brain barrier. The, you know, the other thing we need to remember is when, when we design, we think about these molecules because of their mode of action, Again, you know, going back to the sort of first slide in my talk, we, we, we're not designing inhibitor. We don't need to achieve and maintain occupancy. You know, we're much, much less restricted than that. So again, then it's a question of how much CNS penetration we need with the degrader. Um, so, so I think I, I'm very actually optimistic. Um, you know, I think, I think that we're breaking the rules of, of what we were thinking would be draggable, but also we're breaking the rules of what we, thought would be a drug-like molecules in this field. So I just maybe adding to the point about what's druggable, I think, you know, Georg, Danette, and, uh, and Malin have made already uh, very <laughs> relevant comments. There's very little to add to that, but maybe just to say again, before uh, target protein degradation tipped, you know, we were thinking that druggability was, you know, you, you had to have ligandability before you could have druggability. So, uh, you know, you can be ligandable, uh, you can have ligandability, but you may not get druggability because you can get very good molecules, very potent molecules for a target, but then you might not get a drug. But we thought 
that without ligandability, we couldn't have dragability. I think TPD is now opening the possibility where we could have dragability without ligandability. So, um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Alessio. Um, we have um, here a question uh, that I guess is addressed to Clemens. If there are any specific methods to characterize the protag physical chemical parameters related to your question, to your talk. So I don't have to add anything else than, I, than what I already said. I think, really think that uh, this goes back to a little bit what Alessia said, that we are not far away from uh, dealing with normal uh, low molecular weight uh, compounds that we use to as, as inhibitors. And perhaps we just need to stretch our imagination a little bit, uh, put some of the concepts that I, that I explained a little bit, uh, put a little bit more emphasis there, um, uh, look at permeability, uh, Perhaps also then you don't need to be super soluble if you don't need to cover a, a big concentration range. So perhaps we don't need to consider solubility so much at this point, but, but permeability I think will be, will be one of the things we, we, need, we need to observe. So I, I would caution against seeing protex and then bifunctional degraders uh, a, a total distinction like a, like a black and white versus the, the uh, conventional let's say low molecular weight world yeah thank you so um, um, our audience is uh, interested about hearing more hearing more about the covalent protex and also a question is uh, on reversible covalent protex so if you can comment on that and uh, on the possible advantages to form a, a stable ternary complex um, so maybe george you would like to start uh, the discussion yeah, sure. Uh, I think there's a couple of advantages that, that come with either reversible or uh, non-reversible covalent protex. I mean, obviously, the, the main question is, you know, whether you want to be covalent, typically probably more on the side of the E3 ligase, but also uh, I think particularly for reversible covalent ligands that would bind to the uh, protein of interest, uh, there are some advantages that could also uh, cover um, cellular uh, per, not cellular, not necessarily necessarily cellular permeability, but uh, higher achieving higher intracellular concentration. I think has been shown with that uh, modality, and uh, I think what uh, is going to be an exciting field moving forward is seeing whether these reversible covalent binders on the warhead side can kind of combine some of the advantages of traditional covalent chemistry to. Uh, non-covalent and non-covalent chemistry. So I think there is a very encouraging initial literature um, in, in the field. And I think it's going to be exciting in the next year or so to witness that moving forward. Um, uh, thank you very much. Someone else would like to comment on this uh, topic about covalent products. Uh, maybe Danette. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of interesting work on, on this topic. Um, as Gary mentioned, I think if, if there is covalent, the, the preference or the thinking in the field is the preference that this would be on the E3 side. When we think about the ternary complex formation, having a covalent interaction on either side does change the dynamics of where the compound will be, where it will be bound. You don't have an off rate anymore from one of the targets. And there have been examples where covalent on the target side did not work at all. Um, and also examples where covalent on the target side works and works really well. So I think it, it won't always, uh, Again, like everything in this field, I don't think we can say rule out that covalent will always be bad or covalent is, is preferable, but there, there I think will be a lot of examples where this is target specific and how it regulates that formation of the ternary complex or favors it versus a bivalent you know, interaction with one of the partners will be very important. 
uh, related to your comment, there is a question um, where um, Stephanie is commenting on a paper recently published by Grace Group, where they show that the tertiary, uh, tertiary complex formation is not leading to degradation. Uh, so what do you think that are the determining factor beside the ternary complex formation to have degradation? So um, just so I understand the question, the, the, the ternary complex is not, not leading yeah. to degradation? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, the ternary complex has to form in order for <laughs> degradation to occur. But um, I think we've seen great examples where it has to form long enough for there to be really efficient ubiquitination. Um, and then this can then lead to degradation. Of course, you have examples of ternary complex on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, we've worked on it, Lacey has worked on it, uh, uh, many other people to show that you can have a cooperative and a more stable ternary complex. Uh, this also leads to very potent degraders. But uh, it is possible to have um, an unfavorable, maybe ternary complex, but one that has to sustain long enough for efficient uh, ubiquitination. Uh, thank you. So uh, does someone else would like to add something on this topic? I guess just maybe one comment. It's, it's fairly obvious, but, but maybe, maybe it's still behind the, the question here. Of course, there has to be a lysine at some point at a position um, towards the E2 ligase that's associated with the E3 ligase that then can be ubiquitinated. That's the whole the whole point, I think, of optimizing the linker that you somehow position these proteins with respect to each other. That lysines come in the neighborhood of the of the catalytic part of of the uh, of the E2 ligase. If that doesn't happen, you you won't get any ubiquitination, and of course you won't get any degradation. So uh, a tertiary, tertiary complex has to form, but it's not sufficient. There still has to be, you know, the the, the proteins have to be oriented uh, in in the optimal way with respect to each other. Um, so talking about covalency, um, another question is related to small molecule. If covalent uh, inhibition uh, could be used as a successful strategy to overcome drug resistance. Um, maybe Bal uh, Malin, would you like to, to start with? Uh, Well, I think there are plenty of examples in the oncology setting around successful covalent binders, but uh, I think my understanding of the question is also related a bit to the drug resistance in that uh, oncology setting, whereas actually I'm not working so much myself, in, but uh, <laughs> that that's my understanding that there is plenty of examples already in clinic that's very successful in this uh, so far, but maybe someone else should comment on it if there's doubts about it. I would, I would actually turn the question around and says there's also examples where uh, a covalent drug does not work anymore because uh, of resistance mechanisms. I mean, think of ibrutinib, the BTK inhibitor. Uh, if that cysteine is, is um, point mutated, you know, you will not have a, have a drug anymore. And perhaps also then getting back to our Protec discussion, this is where, where Protex can have um, a huge advantage by perhaps not exploiting that, that mechanism or perhaps uh, exploiting an allosteric binding mechanism or a silent binding mechanism where you deplete the protein rather than uh, just inhibit it either covalently or with, with traditional reversible inhibition. So I think there's opportunities here. Um, thank you. So here we have a question. Um, how can our uh, chemical biologist uh, uh, measure the protax permeability if uh, uh, we can use PAMPA and CACO2 assay or you suggest other tools? Um, so maybe George, would you like to comment on that? Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to comment on that. We don't run these assays in my academic lab. I think what we like to use are, I mean, if we're interested in a particular cell type, uh, we have been using mass spec assays like multiple reaction monitoring where you just lyse the cells and then you measure whatever is in your methanol um, uh, fraction. Um, or we just approximate it by doing cellular competition assays. Uh, knowing that there is a hundred caveats to that, but uh, whether or not uh, products are 
within the range of what is reasonable to measure with this general you know, permeability assays, I think Clemens will be a better person to ask. Yeah, although I have to say I um, haven't looked into this myself too too deeply, but I think there's probably better ways to to address that. Perhaps look at a target engagement assays in in cellular settings is perhaps a little bit more relevant um, uh, rather than measuring absolute permeability. Uh, again, you you need perhaps only minute amounts in the cell to 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 function in catalytic cycles. So we should not. Uh, we should really remind ourselves that we are not about, uh, uh, you know, talking about achieving huge concentrations. It's an it's event-driven pharmacology in that, that case. I think that's perhaps more relevant. You need to get, I agree, you need to get if, uh, sufficient amounts into the cell, but whether you, the, the current permeability assays are, um, you know, really suitable to, to measure that, I, I wouldn't be sure. Perhaps Marlene, you can comment as well. I can just see what we do because we have them readily at hand and you can put high throughput so we do use them to guide us in the design there seems to be some linearity but we also complement it with, like you say Clemens around having the in-cell target engagement assays as well as the what you say yours around the intercellular concentration to get a better understanding of what we are actually looking at but we do use these CACO assays as a quick uh, way of access getting some trends within the series, et cetera, are we moving in the right direction? And perhaps yeah. I, 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 I need to add one more thing because it's quite often misunderstood. All these permeability assays are, were actually developed to predict uh, permeability across the gut wall. We should not forget that. And uh, to a certain degree, you can use them to, to as a surrogate to, 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 to talk about general uh, um, permeability across cell members to get intracellular activity. But I think this is what these assay systems were ultimately designed and validated for. I can maybe chip in as well. I mean, I, I know there's quite little research done on this, but there was a paper, and I'm looking at it on my screen now, that was discovered from the group of Matthias, or published by the group of Matthias Witwe, it appeared in Drug Discovery today of June uh, of last year, and they've compared four product molecules, both uh, PAMPA and CACO2 assays. Uh, their conclusion was that PAMPA is not so reliable in predicting that, and CACO2 was, was more effective. But uh, from reading it, I couldn't really understand their arguments. It was a little bit hand-waving. But for people who, who want to, to read up on that, that's a good reference, I think, to start. Um, Maybe I, I can just add a, yeah. a general comment. Uh, so, I mean, we published a study uh, with Scott Loki, um, who has developed a number of uh, uh, excellent metrics and, and methods including sort of refined pump assays, particularly for beyond rule of five types of molecule, as Clemens mentioned, including cyclic peptides. Um, so this published a few months ago. Um, you know, my, our own experience of running assays like Pampa and Capco was that essentially they, they mean, you know, you get what, what you get in those assays. And as, as Clemens said, they're artificial assays, you know, Pampa is an artificial membrane. Um, CACO is a particular type of cells. And uh, as Clemens said, they, they were devised for other things, not necessarily, not necessarily permeability. Uh, but it's always about, you know, understanding what your assay is, is meant to look at. And, you know, uh, and it's very difficult to, to draw generalizable terms, but certainly from our work with Scott, he was able to see some interesting trends in, even on the PAMP assay. So, um, uh, you know, certainly there's very low recovery, so the assay is not ideal, but still it can give you some, some general trends about what you could get out of your molecules. And then it will depend very much on the lipophilicity of your molecules, so um, about how they perform in these types of assays. So they might not give you a direct answer about cell permeability, but they, they could still be very valuable in you understanding a bit better about the physical properties of your molecule and the likelihood that they have to be developable and more generally to be well performance in, in assays. And then, yes, it's been mentioned about cellular target engagement. I mean, ultimately, that's a really powerful assay. Maybe Danette can comment. She, she, you know, she's developed a really powerful one on this. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alessio. We, we do look a lot at cellular target engagement, both on the target side as well as the E3 side. 
and we can do this in, in intact cells and compare this to lyse cells to really get an understanding of what is the binding affinity and what are the shifts between a, 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 a live cell versus a compromised membrane where we, where we can take out that factor for permeability. I have to say in general, and I think this is what the field has seen, um, uh, high permeability is fantastic, but it's not, it's not a guarantee of successful degradation, right? And the same thing we see some very poorly permeable compounds are fantastic degraders, uh, you know, low nanomolar DC50s or even picomolar DC50s. So um, while it's excellent to understand and might be very, very critical in the early stage development or optimization, um, it's very possible to achieve fantastic degradation with these maybe more, more poorly permeable than say the, the small molecule, especially parental inhibitors from which they're derived. And thank you very much. So here we have uh, several questions on the E3 ligases. If, this, uh, if there is a rational approach to prior, prioritize one or the other when you start uh, uh, with uh, your product research, and then um, how could you design new E3 ligases if you can use artificial intelligence? So maybe George would like to, to share your experience on the E3 ligases. Yeah, there were a, there was a loaded question. I think maybe in terms of rational design, uh, whether you, so whether you can rationally pick one over the other if you want to degrade a particular target. I think if there's structural information available to you, you might be able to do that. Um, but I think that is a, a question that uh, Alessia or others can maybe answer better than I can. Um, I think uh, in terms of what are strategies to expand the space of, of ligandable E3s. Um, I think uh, chemical proteomics has been shown to be particularly uh, powerful here with a lot of work from the Namura's lab or Ben Kravat's lab. So these are technologies that I think are, are very exciting. Um, if you wanna pick your ligase uh, on, uh, based on the merits of what you want, expect your drug to, uh, to do in terms of maybe uh, have a particular tissue selective degradation or have tissues that are spared from degradation. Uh, there are examples already out there, such as the VHL uh, sparing the degradation in platelets that I think are very interesting. And I also think that that is gonna be a field that uh, will evolve over the next couple of years. Yes, um, thank you Maybe just comment on it because uh, of course you need to assess that is your E3 ligase available in the tissue of interest to cell type. So some bioinformatics would work initially and then actually some trial and error in the most relevant cell lines. Uh, uh, so rational or not, but I think still we're quite experimental in our approaches here and try a number of different ones to see what actually works so far. So we still have a lot of questions actually from the audience, but we have to start going to the end of the event. So maybe I can ask um, every of the panelists to maybe share a short take-home message with, for all our young medicinal chemists and chemical biology for the protac or small molecule field. So Alessio, you wanna go first? Well, a message to medicinal chemists. So I guess it's a message to chemists uh, who are interested in biology more broadly and are interested in the potential to develop uh, tool compounds to probe biology as well as uh, compounds that have a potential to be developed as therapeutics and drugs. I would just say, uh, you know, this is revolutionizing the way we, we, we go, you know, the way we probe biology, the way we target biology and the way we can make drugs. We're revolutionizing that in terms of the chemical space that we're exploring. Um, you know, if, if you thought this would look ugly and you wouldn't touch, I think, you know, we're not 20, that might have been okay 2010, but now we're 2021. So rethink that because if, you know, that, that, that could actually be a really good molecule. Um, and, and also we're, you know, revolutionizing how we're uh, probing biology, we can now do things we couldn't do. We can do things in time scales we couldn't do. 
um, and we go after we can go after targets we couldn't do. So uh, you know, be bold and be unconventional, um, and uh, yeah, and go for it. That's my message. Thank you, Alessio. So maybe Danette. Yeah, I, um, my message would be this is a, an incredibly exciting field, not only targeted protein degradation, but don't limit the thinking to proteasomal degradation. Uh, we didn't have a chance to touch on it, but lysosome mediated, mediated degradation, autophagy mediated degradation, or just induced proximity of two proteins that wouldn't normally interact. Uh, to have an action on the target, on the therapeutic target that you want to modify. So um, there's really a wide open space here when you start thinking about multifunctional or multivalent uh, uh, small molecules in this area. Um, Ruk, uh, Rutger, would you like to add something? I guess I would probably say, no, don't give up. Um, but also <laughs> temper your temper your optimism. You know, this is still a very 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 early field. There's only one company that's that's in the clinic with these molecules, looking good so far, um, and and for sure a very very promising area. But but uh, we need to do more and and understand more. And and as a community, we have to focus on that. And then in in a couple of years' time, I think we would be in a much better position to. Uh, to really see if this uh, if this is going to change the, you know, the way we do drug discovery. Um, Clemens, would you like to greet our audience and give a take-home message also? I can, uh, you know, only second what I, what I heard so far. I think we are still, it's still early days, even though we understand some things, we don't understand a lot of things. So I would still see this as an early field. I would encourage everyone to to go for it, who, who's got an interest in there. Um, in addition to what was already mentioned, we should also consider all the drug targets that we couldn't tackle for, for example, selectivity reasons. And if, if anything, I think what Alessio told us today, the BRD4, Promo, different promo domain store and different selectivity you observe. You could have this for, for, for other targets as well, where you where struggled with, with selectivity. In addition to you just perhaps need a, a ligand and you don't need an, an ligand that uh, interferes with any functional uh, consequence. So that's uh, not to be underestimated. I would say go for it. Uh, in terms of my talk, I would say consider these as conventional small molecules and uh, and in terms of optimization, follow the follow the guidelines that, that were already established uh, quite a while ago. Thank you. Uh, George, would you like to to give a take home message to our audience? Yeah, sure. The net stole a bit my fund. I wanted to jump on the proximity and thinking beyond just bringing two proteins together to for the sake of destabilizing one. But so I can take it one conceptual level high and think about the fact that we now have the tools to think about neomorphic pharmacology. So making small molecules that reprogram the function that endow a protein with a new function, not just inhibiting or, or uh, activating it. And, and I think, you know, this is a, a very bright future and we should all be excited to work in it. Uh, thank you, George. And then uh, we have Mali that maybe you would like to share something with our audience. There isn't much more to say. I think I can only echo what others have said. There is a bright future for us. and. We have talked about degradation and I agree with Danette there. There's many other type of degraders to look out for. I think there is more that will happen in that space as you point out, but also looking at some of the very old targets that were undruggable for many, many years, now seeing GLP-1 moving ahead in clinic, etc. So I think also with the new techniques coming in, um, I think as medicine chemists, we can break many of the old traditional undruggable targets with our skill sets. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you very much to, to everybody for the very interesting discussion.